Around every start of the summer, me and my family go on a three-week vacation around the U.S. It's always a blast, and I have very fond memories of the trips, but I will always be more alert on them next time. We were more than halfway done with our vacation, so we had to head home. That meant that we had to go through the whole state of Texas. My dad wanted to drive through the night instead of stopping, so I got some rest. I woke up at around the middle of the night and noticed the car had stopped moving. I sleepily rose from where I was sitting and looked out of the dash window. I saw my dad with a random dude under the hood. I thought, no big deal, until something caught my eye. There was a ditch beside the road and in that ditch, barely, just barely I could see the top of a couple of dudes holding weapons of various types. My blood ran cold but I had to warn my father because he hadn't seen them yet and he had his back turned to them. I thought as quickly as I could and kicked my door open and yelled, Hey dad, the gun fell out of the holder and I I don't want to touch it. This is a lie of course as we don't own a gun and both the man and my dad look confused. I waved for my dad to come to where I was. I then explained the situation and for the first time in my life, he actually looked terrified. He said to the man that I'm going to move the car closer. The man said that's fine and we both jumped in. My dad immediately floored it down the road. We did notice a car's headlights in our back window but after a while it disappeared. We drove the rest of the night and into the morning we weren't tired at all. My mom then woke up and we had fun but kept a lookout. We made it home safe and I did a little research in the area. It turned out that a few months before a couple were actually kidnapped and are currently still missing in that area of Texas. I have no idea if what happened to those poor people could have happened to my father and our family if I didn't see those men. I live in a smallish town in Arizona with very little violent crime. It's mainly drug busts, assaults, domestic abuse cases, very rarely extremely violent crimes like murders or something. We're more known for our retirement and rehab communities. I know not the greatest thing for our town to be known for, but it's absolutely beautiful here and an amazing place to raise a family, but back to the story. Like I said, this story happened a couple of years ago. I'm 20 now, going on 21, and... I think I was maybe 15, 16 during this. The neighborhood I lived in was pretty quiet for the most part. Mostly retired old people and young families with little kids. I think we were the oldest kids in the neighborhood, me and my sister. So one peaceful summer evening, me and my mom are home alone just enjoying the day. My sister was away and my dad was at the store or something. I was in the living room on the couch messing around on my phone, messaging my girlfriend at the time or... Something like that, I don't quite remember. Just standard teenager things, trying not to die of boredom. And my mother is in her room catching up on bills or something when, all of a sudden, we get a sudden knock on the door. My mom peeks her head around the corner looking at me confused because we weren't expecting any company and my dad would have just opened the door. We dismissed the confusion because we thought maybe it was a student going door to door like they do in the evenings and we lived extremely close to one of the local elementary schools and about a 15 minute walk from the high school so we didn't put it past us. Now, brief description of my mother and I at the time, I was still coming into my height and body, I'm male and I was about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, dark hair and starting to get very broad in the shoulders, you know, typical puberty things it does to a guy. But my mother is 4'11", long blonde hair and very stout, not very intimidating but definitely knows how to handle herself. So my mother opens the door and, to our dismay, it was not a student or a possible neighbor. Instead, my mother is greeted by a scruffy looking man with beady eyes and longish blonde hair about my height and nothing too alarming about him, almost pretty innocent looking. He was wearing from what I can remember a white button up with a blue tie and jeans, you know, business casual. As soon as my mom opens the door, you can visually see his surprise turned soon pleasure to see my short mother answer the door. She asks him if she can help him and he starts going on this random spiel about 
how my mom has a very large crack on her windshield of her jeep that's parked very clearly and very obviously in our driveway in front of our front door with no crack and that he can fix it for her and keeps trying to coax my mother out of the house to show her the crack on her windshield. Now my mother is a no-nonsense kind of woman, doesn't put up with anyone's bulls, so she immediately knew the man was up to something and refused to follow him out, telling him that she doesn't need his services and that her insurance covers all glass and bodywork. The man, not seeming to listen, just keeps trying to convince my mother that she just needs to come out of the house to see and he needs to show her what she can't see. Now up until this point he hadn't noticed me standing a few feet back to the side of the doorway. As soon as he noticed me, his entire attitude changed. He seemed to get intimidated by the fact that I was there and was trying a bit more aggressively to get my mother out of the house and he also started asking questions like if we're home alone, where everyone was, why my dad wasn't home now, this is where even I was starting to get irritated with this man. What kind of mobile windshield repair service tries such an aggressive sales tactic, I thought. So, as this thought is running through my mind, I see some movement from behind the man, and all of a sudden another man pops out from behind my mom's car, as if he was crouching behind it just out of sight to pounce the first opportunity given to him as soon as he saw me. He started to pretend to be interested in my mom's crack and bent down to inspect her tires or something. Now at this point, me and my mom knew we were in more danger than originally thought and needed to get him and his buddy to leave. During all of this, the man is still trying to BS my mom outside and his story is starting to slip and change. So me being the protective and cautious person I am, go to my parents' room to grab my mom's 380 handgun and my dad's 45 and suddenly place her 380 on the small of her back which she immediately gripped ready to reveal the weapon at any sign of danger and I stood behind her staring daggers at the man. At this point he starts getting the point and decides he wasn't getting anywhere with his potential victim and her son so he eventually just gives up and made some remark about how it's our loss and walks off and my mom shuts the door. We both look at each other in total disbelief. This kind of thing has never happened before and we weren't too sure how to process it. When I was 15 I lived with my grandmother. She has a really big nice house and always lived alone so I volunteered to live with her. I enjoyed her company so it wasn't a big deal. Around Christmas break, my grandma decided to let a friend of hers from work stay with us. My grandma was a psych nurse, by the way. When she told me a lady, her husband, and their son were moving in, I assumed that they were young and the son was young. Kind of stupid that I didn't ask, right? I know. Well, when they moved in, I was introduced to him. We'll call him B, and B was 36 years old. It struck me by surprise, but I was still polite to all of them. This is when it started to get weird. For the first week, I hardly ever saw them, which was fine by me. I would have my cousin, we'll call her Kay, over a lot around this time. So one night, my grandmother and the friends went out to the casino and B stayed home. Kay and I were in the kitchen making cupcakes when we heard heavy stomping going on upstairs for a while. Then I heard a door slam. I ran to the bottom of the steps and seen my room door had been slammed shut. I could have sworn I had closed it. I assumed the guy checked to see if we were home or something and closed it for me. I wasn't that mad about it, so I went back to cooking with Kay. As we were icing the cupcakes, someone ran downstairs and into the kitchen, and of course it was B. He leaned on the kitchen door frame and stared at us for a moment. We were getting uncomfortable, so I spoke. Hi. He gave me a huge, creepy smile. Hello, beautiful. His voice was so incredibly raspy, like he was in a serious need of water. I ignored what he said and continued to ice the cupcakes. He then started going on and on about how he had seen my pictures around the house and always thought that I was sexy. My heart jumped. Kay quickly snapped back to him before I could. Uh, she's 15? We thought that he would leave us alone after that, but no. He only smiled more. 
The young girls are the best to have my way with them. Then he just walked out. This shocked us to our core. We stood in the kitchen thinking if we should tell our grandmother. I felt bad that they were homeless, but their son was a freaking perv, and we decided we would. After finishing some cupcakes, we made our way upstairs, and he stopped us. He started apologizing, saying he was drunk and was just begging for our forgiveness, and our stupid selves did forgive him. We agreed not to tell and just went into my room. After that, we hadn't heard from him and we went to sleep. I had woke up to use the bathroom and it was pretty late. I wasn't sure what time it was, but the house was pitch black. The bathroom was right across from my room, so I rushed in. When I sat in the toilet half asleep, I heard another room door open. I could hear someone's footsteps. They weren't far, so I could tell that they were in my room. I heard whispering and then someone stomped off and I heard the front door slam. Weird. By then I was done. When I left the bathroom, my room light was on and Kay was sitting up looking really uncomfortable. I asked her what was going on and she told me B came in and asked if we could go to the store with him because he hated being lonely. She told me she said no and to get out and he got upset and just left. I was creeped out by now. As soon as the son came out, we told his parents. They told us their son has some severe mental issues and won't cause us any harm. They apologized for his behalf, and that was it. Here's our next encounter with this creep. It wasn't until about another week since I decided to stay at Kay's house for that time being. We were in my room playing Xbox when B poked his head into the room and asked, could he please talk to me outside the door? So I went. He proceeded to tell me how I was so pretty and he loved my hair. He kept trying to touch my curls as he spoke. What are you mixed with? He kept asking while still keeping this weird smile. I would tell him I'm only African American and he would just stare at me like I was lying. And this is where the conversation got worse. At first he asked me about some of my interests and then just changed completely. He started saying inappropriate things. He said what he would do to me when he got the chance. Not if, but when. And he said what he dreams about and all this disgusting mess. I was done with this and I tried to go into my room. As I turned, he grabbed my hair and groaned a bit. I turned back to him and his hand was in his pants. God, it was disgusting. When I went back in, I told Kay everything even though she had been listening herself and we told my grandma that night. She was absolutely livid and told the family that they were leaving tomorrow morning, and that was it. When they left, I was happy. Extremely happy that I wasn't sneaking around my house anymore with a kitchen knife out of fear that he would pop up somewhere. Even though he was gone, I had found something in the room he stayed in that seriously grossed me out. It makes me shiver and gag just thinking about it. He had left a plastic bag behind and I look inside and found pictures. So many pictures of me. My grandma kept hundreds of copies to give away to the family and he had somehow stolen a lot of them. There were pictures when I was a baby, a child, and even more recent ones all in the bag. Most of them had white material on them. It looked dried, but the ones I had seen at the top were still somewhat wet. My stomach turned as I figured out what that white stuff was but one picture scared me. It was a picture of me when I was about six. I had a swimsuit on and was lying on my stomach in the water. The waves were hitting hard and you could see that I had a massive wedgie and my bottom was showing a little bit. He had written something on the back of that one. It said copy number 32 and had his name under it. 32? This was the 32nd copy? but it was no more of that specific photo in the bag. This disgusting freak had the rest of the copies. I shuddered at the thought of him having all those pictures of me and what he could be doing with them. I had never heard from B or this family again. My grandma got the police involved, but apparently her friend had stopped working due to the embarrassment that was involved. I'm 19 now and still hate to think about it. 
I've submitted it here because my cousin brought it up a few days ago. I don't know where Beira's family is, but I truly hope that he's in prison or anywhere that children or young teens aren't. I was in the 7th grade going from my school in the downtown area of my city to my house. The buses usually are composed of a certain constant demographic, the teenagers coming home from school, the working class adults, and single mothers with their children trying to save a buck by using the bus. In addition to this demographic, there are the two types of disturbances, drug addicts or alcoholics that are loud and disruptive usually begging for a dollar and the middle-aged man or predator preying on middle schoolers or young women, both of which I have had my own encounters with, but today's story is not my own experience. I did have a front row seat of this crazy encounter, though. Now that we have the exposition, on to the story. I find a seat near the end of the bus by myself. Because of the way the buses work, there is one row on each side of the bus with each seat has two sitting spaces, but there's also a twisty area in the middle of the bus. Two seats are directly across from each other in this area. On the opposite side of me is a working class man. Some teenagers behind me and in front of me are the main characters of this story. A dingy, unshaven man and three teenage girls. The man being directly in front of me and the girls in the twisty seats in front of the man. Being that there's only two per seat, one of the girls decides to sit on one of her friend's laps to stay close to and not have a sit beside a stranger. Upon seeing this, the man begins to sort of creepily laugh to himself before obnoxiously adjusting the way he's sitting in a suggestive manner, rubbing his thighs and staring the girl down. As the ride begins and the girl notices him, he starts to pat his thigh as if to suggest she sit down there then leading to verbalize these actions saying things like, Come here girl, come sit here instead. You belong right here. Everyone in sight of this disgusting behavior catches on and they're all watching him. The girl simply scowls at the man and turns away, her friends throwing light insults at him. He attempts in vain. He turns to the working class man who's watching what's going on. He then says something along the lines of, Why is she sitting there? She needs to be on my lap instead. Further commenting on this high schooler's body and doing the buddy-buddy arm nudge with him as if the two were pals. Just a note, she is visibly a high schooler. Our district requires standard school attire, so she had khaki shorts and button-up short sleeve shirt with a backpack, so there's no way that this man couldn't have known that she was underage, but I digress. Anyways, hearing these outrageous statements from the man... The working class man replies with something like, Hey, don't you ever associate with me whatever you think this is. This is a child you're talking about. I come from Detroit, and we put people like you in the dirt. The man, not at all deterred, scoffs and does this hand-flinging motion as if to blow him off. The working class man's stop is coming up, and as he stands, he tells the girl that he apologizes for what she's going through and leaves. The girl tells him on his way out. Thank you, but I'll be able to handle it. Just gotta wait. The gross man turns back to her and says, Handle what? Me? And laughs to himself. I was appalled at his gross statements, but even angrier than me were the adults and male thugs who started standing in the area where the situation was, all witnesses to this atrocity. I remember hearing the gang members all start to get riled up behind me in defense of the girl. Now this guy starts to get a bit scared. He's now stopped talking upon seeing how many people are against him. The girl again goes on to assure the crowd that she's got everything under control and things calm down a bit. That is, until he pulls the string to notify the driver that he wants to leave at the next stop. In a split second, everyone's eyes were back on him. The thugs begin standing up again lingering near the doors just in case he plans to run. The bus begins to arrive to the stop and as the man stands up, so does the girl. He attempts to walk past her, but upon approaching her, she pushes him back, not to get him off his feet, but to get him back from the forming group of people. She does this because as he stumbles backward, like Django, she swings her belt off her waist and yells, 
You like to prey on little girls? You like flirting with little girls as a grown man? And starts beating the brakes off this guy with it. And yes, she was using the metal side. My ears filled with the clinking of metal on his body and head, the slapping of the leather on the skin, and the moans and cries of this fully grown man who was now on the ground in tears attempting to escape from his well-deserved beating. The bus ends up completely stopping, the driver running back to separate the two. The girl is still beating the man with all her might as the bus driver rushes over to pick her up and pull her away from the man. The man ends up crawling hands and knees off of the bus where he then laid on the concrete moaning and crying in pain. Everyone was escorted off the bus and the police were soon called to get the man medical attention. The police ended up detaining the girl and I couldn't find any information about her charges but I hope wherever she is, she's having a good day. As for the man, all I can say is just don't be a creep and bad things won't happen to you. I admire that girl's bravery and the passengers that bonded together for the safety of the girl were the best demonstration of what a community should be that I'd ever seen. This story happened when I was 6 or 7, so in about 1996 or 1997. My family lived out in rural Michigan and every October they would throw a big party called the Hayride. Friends and family would all come over, there'd be a bonfire, hayride, food, music, basically a big country party with a hundred people or so. The hayrides were one of the few times I could stay up super late. After one hayride I was in the second story of the house getting ready for bed. I remember hearing a loud noise outside so I went to the window. It was completely dark out, maybe 10.30 or 11pm. I heard my parents talking outside so I wasn't too concerned. About a football field's length down the road there was a sharp 90 degree turn. I started to see a glow coming from that area. My parents saw it too and were obviously alarmed. I heard my mom come inside and I went to find out what was going on and she sent me back to bed. Years later I found out what had really happened. My parents had been cleaning up from the hayride, going back and forth between the house and the barn. They hear a car crash at the sharp turn in the road, which happened maybe once every two years or so. They left the barn. My mom was going to the house to call 911 and my dad was going to check to make sure the people were okay. By the time they got to the house, they realized the car had flipped and caught fire. They heard people laughing and yelling and then one of them said that there was a house up ahead and that they should go there. My mom said it was the creepiest thing that she had ever heard, the laughing and how the distance distorted their voices. My dad loudly yelled for my mom to get the rifle from the house and call 911. They had to have heard him, but they kept walking. Shortly after my mom got my dad the gun, another car came screeching around the corner towards the people walking. They got in the car, which took off the way it had come, not passing by our house. The fire department eventually came and put the fire out, which thankfully hadn't spread. We live in a small rural community with not a lot of strangers. It should have been easy to learn who these people were, but we didn't. We never found out who crashed the car or who picked them up. So back in 2015, a colleague and I were on a business trip in Girona, Spain. We were going to be there for a couple of nights, so on the first night we decided to go for a walk. It was pretty late by now, and maybe at around 11pm, and all the bars and nightclubs on the strip were full. To really picture this, I need to tell you that the hotel we were staying at was not on the strip itself, but you had to go through a narrow alley to get there. Not your stereotypical dark alley. This alley was pretty well lit with liquor stores and the like on either side. Anyway, me and my colleague decided to walk back to our hotel after a period of time observing the sights and sounds of Hirona at night. But we had a problem. No matter how much we tried, we could not remember where that exact alley back to the hotel was. So we kind of started freaking out. By now, we are at the end of the strip and it seemed kind of sketchy to say the least. 
A bunch of male teenagers approached us with one carrying an empty bottle of vodka asking for information in broken English. We just ignore them and move on. As we keep walking, we notice another well-lit alley, but not the one we needed. I notice a really nice-looking classic-style car parked on the side, as a man is just getting out of it. His windows were really tinted too, so we couldn't see in. We decided to approach him, praying that he can speak good English and ask for directions. He does speak English, but right away I can tell something's off. I tell him the name of our hotel, but as soon as I speak... He stops. Hearing my American accent, he loudly exclaims, Are you Kevin? By now, I'm really shocked at what he just said. He goes on, Kevin, you United States? Motorbike driver? Motorbike? I explain that we're just Americans here on business, but this makes no difference. He seems to be holding himself up in his car, seeming either high on something or just very intoxicated. He then says, Kevin, yes, Kevin, very good, rich, rich motorbike driver. We felt his demeanor change right then. I again explained that I'm not Kevin, nor do I know him as my colleague and I prepare to walk away. This frustrates the man as he begins saying something to us in Spanish in a threatening manner, and we just got out of there as fast as we could, hoping that he wouldn't follow us. Eventually we did get back to our hotel, but... That was the end of our late night walks on the strip in Girana. This happened on Halloween of 2019. My friends and I were feeling the spooky vibes of the month and wanted to do something fun and exciting to satisfy our thirst. Being the dumb college students that we were, we decided on exploring somewhere allegedly haunted in the hopes of seeing some genuine paranormal activity. Since we're from Illinois, the popular destination of Bachelors Grove Cemetery immediately came to mind and it was settled upon. Once the sun had set and night had fallen, we were to make our move, sneaking into the cemetery after it had closed to get the full experience without having to worry about any other visitors. I must admit, I always wanted to do something like this before, but I was genuinely afraid of what might be waiting for us in that cemetery so late at night. Stories always circulated around the various apparitions people had encountered before, the different sounds that chilled them to the bone, and so on. Anyway, all of this was festering inside of me well before we actually started driving over to the cemetery sometime in the evening. It was a pleasantly long drive, but... I wasn't really in the mood to think about anything else except for the potential horrors that roam the cemetery for all eternity, or so they say. Couple in the fact that we were going to be trespassing in order to get through in the first place, and I was a nervous wreck. My friends were apparently doing a much better job at keeping their fears in check though. For the sake of the story, I'll call them Logan, Paul, and Eddie. The entire car ride there, there were laughing and joking around not worried about what we would be getting into or what we might see. Looking back at the whole situation, I should have known that their optimism was a bad sign. No way would we have been able to explore this place without them being the slightest bit nervous. But what's done is done. A little past seven, once night had finally fallen for real and darkness went on in every direction for as far as the eye could see, we arrived. Parking in the main parking lot was out of the question because we did some looking into it and found that in previous years, local law enforcement liked to wait there and catch any would-be explorers before they could even get inside, so we had a backup plan. Since the actual cemetery was located in the center of a dense forest on all sides, essentially forming a square where all the roads would go around it, we were to park at some restaurant that was open super late and had a huge parking lot all the way in the back, furthest away from the restaurant itself and closest to the road. This was in the exact opposite direction from the front entrance of the cemetery, so we figured this was our best chance of getting in while avoiding any cops in our way. From there, we'd cross the street on foot and have a bit of a walk before arriving at a somewhat hidden path leading into the forest. 
Taking this back path would take a bit more to get to the actual cemetery itself since there were trees particularly thick and dense, but it was well worth it when considering the alternative. After everything was said and done, we found ourselves beginning our trek onto the path, unsure of how far we'd actually have to go before we find what we were looking for. It was a windy night, and even though it wasn't especially cold or anything, I still remember my teeth chattering and my skin going cold. Aside from the occasional sounds of leaves being crunched under our shoes as we walked, there was absolute silence. My once cheerful and energetic friends were now, all of a sudden, quiet and subdued. Logan in particular had this odd expression on his face, it being illuminated by my phone's flashlight as we walked. It was some sort of cross between fear and pain, like every step he took was causing him physical harm. Before I could question him about it, we found ourselves at our destination. Here we were, in the heart of Bachelor's Grove, with graves all around us and a certain chill in the air. Everyone split up to cover more ground, promising to call the others over if they were to encounter something. I didn't want us going too far away from one another, but I also didn't want to seem like a complete baby, so I kept my mouth shut and began exploring. Most of the graves I looked at had withered away from time and the elements, so I couldn't really make out anything that was on the tombstones. The few dates that I could read went back to the late 1800s, and a sinking feeling in my stomach started once I realized these people had been dead and decaying in the ground for over a hundred years. Feeling extremely uncomfortable with this realization, I began to back away from the graves and start to look for my friends to see if they had found anything supernatural Yet when all of a sudden, I heard it. Not just me either, all of us did. It was a low, almost unnoticeable if you weren't paying attention, but with the way our senses were heightened, there was no way we would miss it. It appeared to be some sort of chanting, and it sounded like it was coming a little bit north from our direction, further in a clearing. I couldn't make any of the words being spoken or if it was even in English, but there was something creepy about the tone like it was religious and the chanting was some sort of prayer. The voice that was doing the chanting was deep and gravelly, belonging to some man that we couldn't see. The four of us shone our lights on each other to see our expressions and at that moment, we knew what we were going to do. Despite every fiber in my being telling me not to go any further and see what the source of this chanting was, my curiosity got the better of me and I couldn't resist. Eddie whispered to us to turn our lights off completely, while he dimmed his just enough to where it wouldn't attract too much attention, but we would still be able to see with it. The next few moments we spent creeping towards the noise, the more and more I started to lose it. My breathing was uncontrollable, and it felt like my heart was beating a million miles an hour. I was so afraid of what we would find, and yet I still had to know. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, we had entered the clearing and were a mere few steps away from this chanting. Eddie shone his light in the direction ahead of us and for just a brief moment, we saw a cloaked figure bent over something in the grass, still chanting in that unrecognizable language. The thing in the grass looked like some sort of circle with a mark in the center and I swear to God, I wish I could tell you I'm lying about this but when I realized what the symbol was, I felt like throwing up. There was no mistake. It was a pentagram, made of some strange material. For the moment that Eddie had illuminated the site in front of us, I had been able to get a glimpse of the pentagram's material being bright red, and I shouldn't have to say any more about that. Once the light from Eddie's phone hit the back of the man's head, he immediately stopped chanting and stood up still facing the direction of the pentagram. I can only describe the next few minutes as truly unadulterated terror. Before we knew it, he screamed a blood-curdling scream that rattled us to the core and turned around, beginning to sprint towards us. Everything happened so fast. I couldn't even make out the man's facial features except for deep, sunken eyes and an expression that radiated pure hatred. He really did want to bring us harm, and not wasting any time, we all fled the direction we came from and ran faster than I think any of us had ever ran in our entire lives. I couldn't even scream while running. I was too petrified to make any noise. 
Maybe it was a miracle, but we somehow managed to retrace our steps all the way through the path we took to enter the cemetery and forest and eventually came out the main road which was devoid of any traffic for the time being. Afraid of what I would see if I looked back, I made a beeline for the car along with the others and hopped into the back seat, not wasting any time to lock the door and roll up the window. We peeled out of there in no time flat and didn't stop driving 20 over the speed limit until we were at least 10 minutes away. Honestly, I have no idea how far or how long that man chased us, but I do know this for sure. We weren't supposed to be there that night, and we must have been interrupting something important of his. I'll never know what it was, and honestly, I don't hope to ever find out. We never did talk about this experience again after that night, and we never went on another trip to somewhere abandoned or haunted ever again either. I think that fright we felt is enough to satisfy us for the rest of our lives, and I'm thankful beyond words that we all managed to get out together, alive. I've always been bothered by this experience and, to this day, still have dreams about it. I'm now 38 years old, but the story begins when I was 21. Back in 2003, I was living with two roommates in an apartment in Minnesota. They were friends of mine from high school. Our lives were usually pretty boring, just three guys hanging around playing video games, that kind of thing. One day I come home after work, a long shift at the grocery store I was employed by, and my roommates had a Ouija board set up just on the living room floor with their respective girlfriends. They excitedly informed me that they had contacted a spirit. They were asking in all sorts of dumb questions like, what kind of car do I drive and does my boyfriend love me? Just really mundane stuff. A non-believer, I jokingly remarked that the spirit was probably angry with their questions and the board said yes. It felt as if my friends were just messing with me so I decided to run a little test. I sat down with the group and asked its name. The spirit said its name was Mike. I asked it to prove that it was a real spirit and not my friends just dinking around by telling me something only I would know. The spirit, Mike, responded by spelling out S-U-E or Sue, which is a sister I had not and still have not met and never told my friends about. While this was indeed odd, I still wasn't convinced. I next asked the spirit who I would marry. The board spelled out, Kelly Anderson. I didn't know anyone by the name, so I laughed it off and said I didn't believe Mike was real. One of my roommates then mentioned that he read somewhere that if a spirit counts backwards from 10 to 0, they can escape the board. The planchette began to spell out 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, which freaked out the girls and they threw the planchette across the room and put away the board. I didn't think anything of it and went to bed. A month later I was trying to fall asleep one night but couldn't because I felt like something was watching me. I swore I saw a shadow creep along the wall behind my TV that was humanoid in shape but I just wrote it off as a trick of the mind because I was tired. I finally managed to doze off a bit and woke up to a feeling of being dragged off the edge of my bed. When I regained my sense, I was right on the edge of my bed about to fall onto the floor. Still in denial, I thought maybe I had just slept funny. Fast forward to 2007. I'm still working at the same grocery store, and I meet a woman named Kelly who had recently gotten a job there. I didn't think anything of it because her surname was not Anderson. I got to know this woman and we started dating a few months later. In 2009, we got engaged. One night I was sitting with her in the living room of our apartment and I was thinking about the Ouija board incident from six years earlier. I told her the story of Mike and how the spirit informed me I was going to marry a Kelly Anderson, but I scoffed because her last name was different. She got really quiet and just stared at me. I asked her what was wrong and she told me that at one time she was thinking of asking her stepfather, who I had not yet met at that time, to adopt her. If she had done this, her last name would have been Anderson. It freaked me out a bit. 
In 2010, we got married and moved into a small house in Wisconsin. Strange things started happening around our new home immediately. I would hear whispers in the night as I tried to sleep. Kelly never heard anything. Sometimes I would wake up and see the shadows of little creatures moving about outside our bedroom door. Eventually, I started to wake up to a feeling of something sitting on my chest. I would be unable to move, and I would see this horrible being staring down at me as it pinned me. It was wispy and malevolent looking. I would eventually regain my ability to move again and fight it off, and it would disappear. I know this sounds like sleep paralysis, but under the circumstances, I don't believe it was actually that simple. Not to mention, this continued to happen all the way to 2012, when my son was born. For two years, I fought off this entity that would come multiple times a week to try and... What? Possess me? Kill me? I have no idea. I was constantly tired and worn out. Throw a newborn into the equation and I was exhausted. The attacks continued until my son turned three months old. Then one night I heard a strange voice say something in an unfamiliar language on my baby monitor. I ran into my son's room, but no one was there. Not a thing. After that night, the attacks on me continued, but became more sparse. Eventually, it would maybe happen a couple of times a month. Unfortunately, in 2014, things did not work out with Kelly, and we got a divorce. She moved back to Minnesota, and I started to see a new woman a few months after our divorce was finalized. The second Kelly moved out, the attacks stopped completely. I got remarried in 2016 to my second wife. I have been attack-free for six years now, but I still think about Mike and the Ouija board. Was this a spirit that was always attached to my ex? Did it attach to me because of the Ouija board and now has attached itself to my son? I ask him if he's ever experienced anything unexplained, but I never really get a direct answer. And I fear I'll never have that answer. When I was 13, I broke my leg in a nasty bicycle accident. I ended up in a plaster cast from my hip to my ankle for eight weeks. As it was coming up on Christmas, my younger brother wanted to go to the theater to see the Christmas show. I was 13, moody, and accompanied by a bright pink cast everywhere I went. I was not feeling it. My dad, never one for going to the theater, offered to take me to Pizza Hut instead. It was a rare opportunity to spend time with my dad, who was often working very long hours. He worked as a police officer, which at the time I didn't really take any interest in what he did. We had a great evening at Pizza Hut, and we got back in the car to go home with full bellies and some leftover pizza. I remember babbling away at my dad as I had been the whole night. Enthralled, I had my dad's undivided attention. After a while, I noticed he wasn't really responding anymore. We were fairly near home, but still on a main road before we turned off towards our housing estate. At first, I thought he just lost interest, but I glanced over and noticed he was permanently looking in the rearview mirror. I asked him what was up, and he said, The car behind us has been following us all the way from Pizza Hut. I glanced behind and commented that we were still on main roads. I couldn't see that this was an unusual route for this guy to take. He said I need to see whether he is, I don't want to lead this guy to our house. I rolled my eyes. My dad was always paranoid about stuff like that. We couldn't even tell friends we were going on holiday because he was convinced the house would be broken into while we were away. We were coming up to a residential area before ours that I knew from doing a newspaper route. I suggested the street coming up on the left as it looped around in a horseshoe shape through a housing estate and brings you back out on the same road we were on, just further up. Nobody would take this road to come out onto the main road again. My dad turned off, and so did the car. I will never forget that feeling, that sinking feeling as I watched the car sharply turn behind ours. The car placed its high beams on, and I let out a gasp and looked to my dad. He'd gone into work mode. He had completely shut me out. He accelerated down the street, and as we came to the main road, I saw that there were many cars still on the main road. He pulled straight out onto the main road, 
meaning the car coming on the main road needed to brake sharply and held down their horn at us. I kept my eyes on the road, breathing deeply as my dad weaved in and out of lanes. A part of me was completely terrified and a part of me was still convinced that this was not really happening, that he had exaggerated or mistaken this. He wasn't really following us. I dared to look in the side mirror and saw it was a different car behind us. I felt myself relax a little. We turned left at the coming roundabout, giving very little room to anyone in a few moments of holding my breath thinking we were going to hear the sound of metal on metal. The street we had turned on was slightly quieter than the roads previous. I slowly glanced into the side mirror. It was still a different car behind us. I sighed relief and thought this had really been my dad's imagination. Suddenly, the rearview mirror became completely illuminated again and I awkwardly turned in my seat to see a car pull out sharply from behind the car behind us and pull in quickly behind ours again. I look at my dad again. He grabbed his phone from his pocket and told me to call someone in particular in his phone and put it on speaker. My hands are shaking. I could barely press the buttons. A cheerful voice answered and before he could say anything else, my dad quickly summarized what had happened. There was a pause and I could hear voices speaking in the background. Radios, beeping and answering through radios. My dad barked at me to keep naming the streets we were on to the guy on the phone as my dad randomly turned down streets, trying to keep to the main roads. I'm randomly calling names and trying to remember to say the direction we were heading. The car was so close behind us and completely blinding any view behind us. All I could think was, please don't hit us. If we crash, I can't run. What can I do? My leg had only just been plastered. I knew I stood no chance. I suddenly wondered if they were getting close enough to take a shot at us. This for me was unthinkable. It was in England. That is not the norm. Why would someone want to shoot us? We continued to weave down the streets in random turns as I was tossed around in the front seat, clutching onto the mobile in my trembling hands. The voice on the phone shouted, Turn into the Tesco car park that's coming up on the left and we have three response vehicles coming from the other direction. My dad sharply turned into the car park, skipping the red light. I shut my eyes, again waiting for the sound of metal on metal. As we swung into the near empty car park, the car behind us is in close pursuit. Blue lights surrounded our car from what felt like all directions. The sounds of sirens were deafening. My dad got straight out of the car and ran behind the car. I screamed, still thinking someone could have had a gun, and tried to look over my shoulder to see when my door swung open and a police officer was crouching into the car to help me get out. My arms were completely jelly and I could not even use the crutches to help me stand. Another police officer came and between them they helped me as I hopped to the back of the police car. They were kind and tried to distract me as I was trying to see what was going on and where my dad was. I couldn't really see from my angle and I also couldn't turn properly due to my leg. They did their best to reassure me and one had clearly just been through the nearby McDonald's drive through and they offered me his tea. I just sobbed, begging them to tell me what was going on. My dad, after some time, came over to the car and told them to take me home. He had checked and my mom was back home with my brother. As the police car turned around in the car park back towards the entrance, we could see the police surrounding the vehicle, and three men in what looked to be their late twenties were handcuffed, leaning over the car whilst a sniffer dog and two police officers were taking things out of the car, one of which was a baseball bat. When my dad got home later that night, I asked him what it was about. Who were those men and why were they following us? He was very reluctant to tell me anything. He did admit it was because of him that they were following us. He explained that he was in a drugs team that dealt with, how I understand this as an adult, the interception of large shipments of drugs that were being transferred across the country and sometimes people lost a lot of money when they were caught. I just stared at him. I had no idea what to say. He just shrugged and said, Sometimes people get upset about that. It started at the drive through on the way to work yesterday. My coffee was already paid for, 
The woman at the window gave me a huge beaming smile and told me that the car right ahead had paid for my drink as a random act of kindness. Uh, there's no car in front of me, I told her, feeling almost stupid for saying anything. Her smile faltered a little bit and I could see her hands shaking as she adjusted her collar. The black car in front of you paid for it, she repeated. Her smile was forced. It didn't reach her eyes. I glanced in front of me. Nothing. Are you okay? I asked her, and her bottom lip trembled. Please just take the coffee, she hissed through her teeth, leaning in as if someone would overhear us. I took the coffee. There was traffic on the way to work. As always, I couldn't help but think about the woman at the drive-thru. I know this year has been hard for everyone, but she looked uh, terrified, like a rabbit caught in headlights. I took a sip from the coffee inside. My boss had been difficult for the past few months. It was almost a relief to sit in traffic instead of being at work. Now, James is the kind of boss who gets his kicks from making me feel like an idiot. His favorite trick is calling me up to the front during meetings for questions I don't know the answer to. Seeing his smug face staring up at me as I squirm makes me want to drive slower and slower into this terrible job every day. I wish he'd take a long walk off a short pier. That's when I saw the car. A black sedan behind me. That was odd. I could have sworn that it had been a red convertible five seconds ago. I cranked my neck to see the driver in the rearview mirror and caught a glimpse of a man in a dark suit. He was smiling, a wide grin on either side of his face. My phone rang, almost making me jump out of my seat. Hello? Laura. It was Gina, my boss's secretary. Her voice sounded harried, muffled, as if she had a cold. What's wrong, Gina? Are you sick? No. She whispered. It's James. They found him an hour ago. Laura. He's dead. What? How? I heard Gina's quiet sniffing break down into sobs. I... The police said I can't. I'm just supposed to tell you to not come to work today. Gina stammered over her words, and I quickly told her it was fine. I turn around and head home. The man from the black car caught my eye as I turned into the next exit. It might have been my imagination, but his smile had gotten wider. This morning, I woke up to a package on my doorstep. A little box, packaged neatly in my favorite color, with a bow on top. A black car was circling in the parking lot outside as I picked up the package and took it inside. I locked my door behind me. As I unwrapped it, the smell hit me immediately. It was like roadkill left outside. I had to cover my nose as I lifted the lid of the box. It was a head. James's head, with a golden ribbon and a note placed directly on top. I stumbled to the bathroom and threw up in the toilet. This couldn't be happening. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911 as quickly as I could. Hello? A voice answered and I breathlessly explained everything that I could, uh, the gifts, the car, uh, the note on top of the head. Open the note, the dispatcher caller whispered. Uh, what? Please, just do it. He'll know if you haven't. The dial tone clicked, and he was gone. It took me three hours and half a bottle of whiskey to do it. I could hear the noise of a car driving around outside. It felt like I was losing my mind. Hello, Laura. The note began. Today, a man will ask you to flip a coin for him. Regardless of the outcome, you will tell him that you flipped tails. I drank until I passed out. When I woke up, both the note and James's head had vanished, but the smell of rot was still seeping into the carpets. It took a few hours before he approached me. I was at the gas station buying another bottle to try and forget everything that had happened. Maybe it was a nervous breakdown. Maybe there had never been any package. Can I ask you a favor? He was quiet, 
with dark circles underneath his eyes. Can you flip a coin for me? I could feel my chest constricting. I tried to hide the look of fear that I knew was on my face. Sure. My voice was shaking. I took out a coin, flipped it, and peeked under my hand. Heads. That tails. I lied quickly. The man's face fell. Makes sense, he said, and gave me a half-hearted smile. He left without buying anything. As I felt around in my pocket for the rest of the spare change, I felt paper on my fingertips. It was a note. How did someone manage to put it in my back pocket without me knowing? Had it been there the whole time? Thank you, Laura, for your random act of kindness. More instructions to follow. Was this just a really bad prank? Was the guy who had asked me to flip the coin in on it too? I'd almost convinced myself, until I left the store and saw the man from the gas station in his car. Something was glinting in his hand, catching the light. I squinted, trying to see. He pointed it upwards towards his chin. Then I heard the gunshot. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream to catch an invite to my discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon and maybe even pick up some let's read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, this is a certified hood classic.